My name is John Amos. I'm a professor of strategic management and organisation at the University of Edinburgh Business School. And my interests are primarily around institutional and organisational change and trying to understand how that happens or why it doesn't happen when we think that it should happen. So I've got various current projects on at the moment. Um, one is looking at uh, civil justice change within Scotland. So we've been looking at that. There's a doctoral student of mine, Eli Ozturk, who's uh, taken the lead on that, and that's going to be her PhD dissertation. So we've looked at the way in which certain reforms have been <coughs> developed and then instigated, and why they haven't materialised in the way in which people thought they would. Uh, we've got another project that is looking at um, a charity, a national charity that's gone through an extensive series of reforms and we've been looking at how that's plan, uh, panned out over time, why people have come in and changed things in particular ways. They've had a new chief exec, some new directors that have come in. Um, we've looked at the reforms that they've, they've instigated and then tried to understand why certain outcomes have materialised in particular ways. So those are the two main projects and then we've got another paper looking at the migration crisis and trying to understand uh, the way in which people are perceived um, following certain key incidents, so in our case the death of Alan Kurdi and the publication of that photograph. So yeah, so those are, are three things that are ongoing at the moment and then there's various other projects. It was very much phenomenological and it was being in the UK at the time of the migration crisis was really at its height and it's still significant now but um, it was really 2015 where there was an awful lot going on and there was a lot of commentary in the media and it was predominantly negative at least that's how it seemed to me um, even though we were seeing pictures of people dying uh, and boats tipping over and trucks with dead people in them and then the picture of Alan Kurdi lying dead on the beach was published and that seemed to shift things and overnight people's language changed, uh, people's sentiment changed, policy was talked about as being changed so that really led to an interest in a you know across the social sciences, across the social sciences economists seem to have an awful lot to say about various social phenomena and understandably so um, but I also think that you know there's others within the social sciences who also should have a voice and I find that organisation theorists and institutional theorists don't perhaps get involved as they might and so I think we've got we should be taking an interest in some of these issues and so whether it was childhood obesity or it's um, the migration crisis or inequality, you know, I think there's, not all our work has to be in those areas, but I think it's worth us spending some time thinking about these issues and what we can contribute to the debates on them. Uh, so that was really my interest, is seeing this flip of a switch, so you get this shift overnight and then why that occurred as it did. Our point there is that um, this is a piece with Kamal and Johanna and our point there is that institutions are enacted by people um, and it's the things that we do all the time that really bring about change or institutional stability. So what we wanted to do in that chapter was look at four different ways in which institutional theory might be able to contribute to our understanding of inequality. So we talked about institutional logics, we talked about discourse, we talked about identity, and we talked about the micro foundations of, of institutions. And so what we were looking at there was the way in which people in their everyday lives and the actions that they take can reinforce systems of inequality. 
uh, or can undermine those systems of inequality in a positive way. So, so that's what we were talking about there. And, and our position was that these very micro interactions can lead to more macro change. And we give an example in there of the banking crisis in 2007, 2008, and the way in which banks shifted from a 300 year, or even more in some cases, position of being very risk averse and selling very safe products to being much more competitive and responding to market forces and being much more aggressive in selling and extending themselves into areas where they'd never been before. And that was a contributing factor to a major systemic failure that was worldwide. So we can see these micro changes and we plot them through um, at a bank level, but they were also, because they were reproduced globally, um, they had huge ramifications, uh, as, as we all saw. So I, to come back to your point, I think the micro fundamentally is linked to macro level change, but what we haven't done very well is plot the way in which those two levels, and you could talk about a meso level in the middle as well, the way in which those levels are recursively linked. Um, we still don't really understand that very well in terms of, our, of how institutional processes unfurl over time. I think that private sector organisations are much more susceptible to change and, they're much, and they, they alter much more quickly. So they will recognise that there are shifts going on in their institutional context and they will need to do something about it and they will act in particular ways more quickly or if they don't then they will die. Um, public sector organisations change much more slowly in the certainly in the, the evidence that I have, the work that I've done. So if you're interested in temporal phenomena, looking at how things change over time, public sector organisations can be more challenging because it, doesn't, it seems that not much changes very quickly. Um, that's a bit of an exaggeration and a bit of an overgeneralisation, but, but, but generally that tends to be the case. So you're going to get less change and less rapid change in public sector organisations than private sector organisations. But if you're interested in social phenomena, the way in which people act and interact and why they interact in particular ways, of course that happens in both types of organisations. So, and non-profits, you know, I've done work in non-profits as well. And you can see these things happening in all sorts of organisations. So I'm not sure in terms of social processes there's that much difference. Certainly in terms of responsiveness, I would say that there is a difference at the organisational level. Well, I think that that particular project is quite interesting in the sense that we're seeing a lot of unintended consequences. It's still ongoing, but for example, one of the things that we found was that change was driven by somebody very high up, in fact, the top person, the Lord Chief Justice within the Scottish legal system. And he wanted to reform the civil justice system. He said it was outdated and it wasn't fit for purpose. That was in 2007. So we started a review. And in 2014, the findings started to be implemented. And so we decided to follow in real time what was happening. And at the start, people said it would be fundamental change for the Scottish legal system. And I won't go into all the details as to why that was the case. But even though people who were actively involved in it as solicitors, as barristers or advocates as we call them in Scotland, as judges, as politicians, thought there would be radical change, there wasn't. And so we were very interested in why this was the case. Why are we not seeing this radical reform that everybody thought would happen and hasn't happened? And what we're finding is that when you look at professions that the bonds are very, very strong 
and so the institutional forces necessary to break these bonds in this case weren't strong enough. So it's an interesting case of institutional maintenance and why institutional maintenance takes place um, in a particular context. So yeah, it's, um, I mean, we're still processing the data, we're still theorizing from it, but predominantly, empirically, that's what we found, this, this lack of a change that everybody thought would happen. There has been some change, but it's not on the scale that people thought would be there. I think, you know, we, we get e e economists talking. So, for example, inequality, you know, there's lots of books, lots of journal articles done by economists. And Thomas Piketty's book is a great example, you know, it's had a huge impact. Um, but we don't hear much from scholars from other social sciences. And I think particularly in management and organisation, if we think about where people spend a lot of their time and where people derive their economic resources, it's through the organisations that they're employed by. Right? So we really should be thinking about why do we have people in poverty who are working? You know, how, how in a capitalist society, how and why is that the case? And we can document that pretty easily uh, and we can comment on that and we've got theories that explain that. So we need to do more to articulate why it is that this is, you mentioned poverty, this is a major source of poverty uh, and in-work poverty, particularly in the UK and, and in the US, is a major issue. So we can talk about that, we can, we can comment on that, we can theorise that. Uh, so there's more for us to do there. Climate change is another one. You know, we, we're starting to see some articles on climate change. Um, we can think about uh, other grand challenges. We talked about the European migration crisis, right? That's another one. So there's various of these issues that we can talk about and we should be theorising from. And I don't think that we need to do all our work in this area, and, and not everybody needs to do it, but as, as, as a group of scholars, we should be spending some of our time, or at least some of us should, thinking about these issues and trying to find space to write and talk about these issues. And I think they're very rich sources. So Oxfam, for example, has just gone through a major crisis in the UK and globally. Um, because of the basic human resource practices and the lack of monitoring that they've had and the way in which people have been able to get away with things that they shouldn't have been able to do. Now, you could, as a human resource scholar, you could look at those things in a, and that would be a rich source of data that would allow you to theorise and you can get as much from understanding that as you can from looking at HR issues in a car manufacturer or a health system or, or something else, right? So we can change the context and use the context to inform our understanding of theory, but do so in a way that also is potentially relevant to a broader societal issue. And that, I think, is where we can spend some of our time. I would encourage students, A, to publish, and be thinking about that from the word go and be talking to their supervisors as soon as they walk in the door. What projects can I get involved in? How can I help? What can I do? You know, where can I be the third author on a paper or a fourth author on a paper by providing some assistance? And that way you're learning the ropes of the publishing game and then you've got your own work. What side projects can you get involved in? Or you might be a first or second author working with your supervisor, working with another faculty member or even a more advanced PhD student um, that you can get involved in. And then also thinking about, right, what other skills, what other tools can I develop? So teaching, where can you get teaching experience? Not just as a teaching assistant, if possible, can you get first-hand teaching experiences? You need to be prepared to go out on a global market that's competitive.